Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Royce, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore some of the mystical folklore concerning the sun and the moon. The folklore of the sun, that glowing orb that brings us life, and the moon its nighttime counterpart. The folklore between night and day, the folklore between dark and light. And dark and light is a quite apt description of the kind of folklore that we've got coming up. Some of it is very light and uplifting. It will help you with your fortunes. It might help you with your love life. On the other hand, we have some darker lore with terrifying death omens bringing doom to entire households and turning the water in the wells impure and too evil to drink. And if that wasn't enough, we've got some dragons and serpents and witches and all sorts of diabolical creatures thrown in for good measure. And with so much lore to squeeze into one episode, that's enough. Build up. Let's crack on with the good stuff. And so... To begin, at the beginning. And the sun, so folklore tells us, has a divine essence. And it does a very important job for us mere mortals. Because when its golden rays infuse the land which allows the food to grow, it infuses that food with its own divine essence. And, as a result, when we eat the food, we are consuming that divine essence which goes into us. So not only does the sun give us food, it makes the food divine and makes us divine at the same time. What a wonderful star and what a wonderfully jolly happy star to this episode. And just as wonderful is the fact that the sun can dance. Yes, dance. And we are told that a Carmarthenshire veteran said that when he was a boy, which would make it roughly in the middle of the 19th century, but when this Carmarthenshire man was a boy, all the people in his home district firmly believed that if a person went up into the mountains early enough in the mornings at any time in the summer, they would positively see the sun dancing. So to see the sun dancing, really, you just need to get up nice and early in the morning. And this Carmarthenshire veteran wasn't alone in thinking this. And the sun, we are told, is always described as dancing on the morning of the great festivals, which gave rise to the expression prevalent in many parts of rural Wales, to quote once more, I can see the sun dancing before my eyes, which means that it glittered. And in some superstitions, the sun is described as laughing and being joyful. So all of this folklore tells us that people really did see the sun as a big, jolly, happy, beaming light in the sky. And fear not if you're starting to think, where's all the the creepy, spooky, eerie folklore I tuned in for? That is coming up very soon. But to continue with the jolly law for now, and with the sun being so important, anything that might hamper it in some way was naturally considered evil. And there was nothing more evil than those dreaded eclipses that blocked it out altogether. And we are told that in the folklore of Wales, the sun was supposed to hide his face before any great sorrow or national disaster. Eclipses were regarded as ominous of wild warfare and danger of defeat. And you might have noticed I referred to the sun there as he. The sun is often referred to as male, the moon as female, but we'll come to that soon. And back to eclipses. And eclipses meant bad news. It was not a good time to go to war. It was not a good time to do your shopping. It was not a good time to do anything. Beware the eclipses. And during an eclipse of the sun, people in Wales, we are told, covered their wells, fearing the water itself would turn impure. That's how bad eclipses were. It could turn your water impure. 
Hewa. And there's even what is described as an ancient myth attached to eclipses, to explain eclipses, and it involves He Gadarn. He Gadarn, a legendary Welsh hero who I last spoke about on episode 99, The Witch in the Moon, if you did want to check that out afterwards. But it involves this legendary Welsh hero, his devilish adversary, Black Wings, and Caridwen, who in this myth is the Moon Mother. Nowadays, the name Caridwen has become associated with many different tales and many different ideas. But for the purposes of this apparent ancient myth, she is the Moon Mother. And we're told that he, Gadarn, is determined to punish his adversary, Black Wings, for his misdeeds. But he is not to be found having hidden himself under the earth. So Black Wings is hiding from he, Gadarn, under the earth. But Caridwen reveals his whereabouts and Black Wings is punished. He, Gadarn, captures him, punishes him, and in revenge, Black Wings pursues the sun and the moon, which is the personification of these heroes. The sun is he, Gadarn, the moon is Caridwen. And whenever a hand-to-hand encounter ensues between them, an eclipse occurs. So, an eclipse, according to this ancient myth, or according to folklore, I should say, which claims this is an ancient myth, an eclipse is black wings, the evil black wings fighting with the sun and the moon, fighting with he, Gadarn, and Caridwen. And as mentioned, I won't dwell on those characters too much here because I did record an episode about them not so long ago, episode 99, if you did want to check that out. So we'll move on quickly to the Druids because we can't can't talk about people worshipping the sun and ancient Welsh myths without mentioning the Druids of Britain. And we are told, according to folklore at least, that the Druids decreed that every official act was to be discharged in the eye of the light and the face of the sun. Thus, their great convocations, which is a fancy word for their get-togethers and their meetings, were held at the solstices and the equinoxes, while the minor congresses were held at the new and full moon. So solstices and equinoxes were important times for the Druids to get together, and all Druidic services and rites were celebrated between sunrise and sunset. So According to folklore, at least, the Druids used the light of the sun for all of their important gatherings, which was then determined by the time of the year. And one such festival, more than any other, I think, stands out as being associated with light and, in particular, fire, and that is Beltane. And much like the way the sun infuses our food, it also infused our homes. And we are told that at the spring festival of the Druids, the sacred fire was brought down from the sun. So the sun, not only does it infuse the food that we eat, it infuses the fire that we light. And no hearth in Britain was held sacred until the fire on it had been rekindled from that of the Beltane. And this festival became the Easter season of Christianity. Now, just to repeat myself and to make myself perfectly, perfectly clear, this is according to Welsh folklore. This entire episode is according to Welsh folklore, which may or may not be historically accurate and which may or may not be my personal opinion. So if you disagree with any of this, don't blame the messenger. Blame the folklorists from centuries gone by. But we are told this season of Druidic fire festivals became the Easter season of Christianity. And moving on to the next festival of the Druids and the next comparison with Christianity. And folklore tells us that the midwinter convocation of the Druids was a time for cutting the mistletoe with a golden crescent or sickle from the sacred oak and this represented our Christmas. So at midwinter the druids would 
cut the mistletoe with a golden crescent or sickle from the sacred oak, the most important tree in the forest. And the three berries of the mistletoe represented the deity in his triple dignity. And the growth of the mistletoe on the oak was the symbol of the incarnation of the deity in man. So there's a lot to take in there in one short paragraph. But we can thank the Druids, according to folklore at least, for mistletoe at Christmas. And the three berries on it represented the deity in his triple dignity, rather than just a chance to give someone a cheeky kiss like we do nowadays. Now, moving on to magic, as as you do, a seamless transition there from Christmas to magic, but moving on to magic. And in Welsh folk stories, all magical herbs are represented as gathered before sunrise. All healing waters should be drawn and quaffed before sunrise sunrise so if you like to dabble in a little magic and a little witchcraft the sun again played an important factor in when you gathered your ingredients and also if you wanted to keep freckles away i don't know why you would there's nothing wrong with freckles but if you did want to keep them away mayflowers gathered just before sunrise is what you needed and really delving further into the realm of folk stories. But sunrise was seen as this magical time when dragons, yes, dragons, icons of Wales, you don't get much more Welsh than dragons, but when dragons and flying serpents were supposed to count their gold. So sunrise is when the dragons and similar creatures were doing their accounting. And I like to imagine the dragons almost in a Scrooge McDuck kind of scenario where they're just surrounded by pools of coins they can just dive into. And I think if, if you were a hobbit and you were thinking of breaking into a dragon's lair, sunrise is probably the best time to avoid. That's when they're awake, counting their money. Wait until the moon comes out. And we are told that one superstition of very old standing concerning the sun was that he is going to rest. He is awaken. So the sun again referred to in the masculine here, but the sun is described as actually going to sleep. So when the sun goes down, the sun isn't just isn't hiding, isn't going off somewhere else. It is going to sleep. And when the sun rises, it is as we do. It is awakening again for a new day. And this ties in with ideas of the break of day, because the sun at the break of day or Toriada Deeth in Welsh and the day star Ursiren Deeth waited upon the sun and heralded its rising. So when the sun did rise, when it finally woke up, it was a moment to be celebrated. And more than that, it was a moment to be born. Yes, born. Because, to quote, people born at sunrise were regarded as likely to be very clever. Those born in the afternoon or about sunset are described as lazy. So if you do know any lazy people, it might be a good idea to check what time of day they were born because it might not be entirely their fault before you are too hard on them. Now, moving on to the moon, the darker half of the episode, and to quote, the new moon is considered propitious for all fresh undertakings. Thus, in Welsh law, it is mentioned that if you move into a new house or change from one residence to another at the time of new moon, you will have plenty bread and to spare. And if you count your money at the time of new moon, you will never have an empty purse. So there are benefits to the moon rising as well, especially the new moon. If you're thinking of moving home or just counting your money, that's the time to do it, because as that lovely Welsh expression tells us, you will have plenty bread and to spare. You will have plenty. And maybe somebody should tell the dragons about this, because if they're busy counting their money at sunrise, really, they should be waiting until the new moon. But there's more. There's more good news and maybe some bad news associated with the moon, because we are told that wedded happiness 
and household stores will thrive and money will increase if you gaze at the moon on the first new moon night, which is, is quite a specific piece of law there. Not so much the wedded happiness bit. I imagine most people back in the day were hoping for wedded happiness. How many people were turning to folklore to help with the prosperity of household stores? I'm a little bit less sure of, but Either way, if you wanted wedded happiness or to help out your local household store, all you had to do was gaze at the moon on the first new moon night. And to continue, you should never look at the new moon through glass or trees, for it is unfortunate. So, before looking at this moon, make sure you are outdoors or unobstructed with glass or trees or anything else in the way. And it is also lucky to cut the hair and the nails on new moon nights. So again, a good time to get a haircut and a manicure. But there is also some bad luck, very bad luck. And if one member of a family dies at the time of a new moon, three deaths are likely to follow. Talk about bad luck. Talk about a death omen that you really don't want to see. Never mind one death. You're going to get three deaths. Well, you're going to get four deaths because you've already had one. And then there's another three on the way. And incidentally, talking about death omens, I will be dedicating the entire next episode to death omens. But back to this particular death omen. And if somebody in the family did die at the time of a new moon, it was looking pretty bleak for an other three people. Now, moving on to some rapid fire bits of folklore about the moon. The next few minutes will overwhelm you with how much folklore I'm going to cram into this. And we are told that healing herbs and dew should be gathered at new moon. A nice straightforward handy bit of law there. But trenches made at new moon time will fall together. But at the same time, trenches made at full moon will grow grow wider and deeper. So new moon bad for trenches, full moon good for trenches. And to turn your back to the new moon when wishing for anything is unlucky. So if you are looking at the moon with a wish, whether it's peace on earth or you just want a flashy new Ferrari, make sure you keep eye contact with that moon. And moving on, and wood cut at new moon is hard to split but at the full moon, it is easily cut. So again, full moon is good. That's when you want to be cutting wood. And I've just accidentally made my own folkloric rhyme there as well. New moon is good. That's when you want to be cutting wood. Although you should also be careful. I imagine most people are cutting wood outside. And you don't want to be turning good luck into bad luck by accidentally cutting something that isn't wood. But moving on. And the full moon, as opposed to the new, was propitious to all operations needing severance, which is another fancy way of saying that if you had to end something, to dismiss something, to dismiss somebody maybe, the full moon was a good time to do so, unlike the new moon by the sounds of it. And quickly moving on, this is rapid fire folklore, and we are told that grass should be mown, and that's mown M-O-W-N, as in cut, not as in stop moaning. So grass should be mown at the full of the moon, in this way, the hay dries quickly, and I have no idea if that works. Frankly, I hate mowing grass at the best of times, never mind during a full moon. But to continue, if a bed is filled with feathers, when the moon has passed the full, the newly plucked feathers will lie at rest. And quickly moving on to the last of our quick fire bits of folklore, which is that winter crops must not be sown in the moon's idle or third quarter. So I've just bombarded you there with more folklore about the moon than you'll ever need. And there will be a test at the end of the episode to make sure you are all paying attention. But before we finish, I want to wrap things up by looking at a specific part of the moon, which the folklorists call the spots on the moon, and which we probably have a more scientific name for nowadays, but they look like spots, so spots they are. And folklore tells us that the spots on the moon are accounted for in the following way in Wales. A man went out gathering faggots of wood on Sunday, and God 
punished him by transporting him to the moon. There he is doomed to walk forever with a large bundle of sticks on his back. In some parts, they say his dog went with him and may be seen at his heels. So there's an explanation. When you look up at the spots on the moon, you might be able to see that man who has been punished by God, who is doomed to walk forever with a large bundle of sticks on his back. And very quickly, as I'm sure regular listeners will have heard me say many, many a time, but the Welsh, when most of this folklore was recorded, were good, honest Christian folk. And as such, Christianity plays a very important role in the folklore, well, in in the culture of the country. And that is why this man should not have been gathering faggots on a Sunday. And that is why God punished him. Although you do have to feel sorry for the dog, if indeed that poor dog did go to the moon with him, to the best of my knowledge, that that dog was not being blasphemous. But again, this this does happen in Welsh folklore. There's, there's the very popular story of Devil's Bridge, which I've mentioned many, many, many a time, in which at the end, an innocent dog might or might not have their soul stolen by the devil just so a woman can rescue her cow. But I like to think as as a dog lover, as, as an animal lover, as a cow lover even, I like to think the animals all lived happily ever after. And on that note, so ends another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And as always, if you've enjoyed this episode and you don't want to miss any other episodes, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And as I mentioned throughout this episode, this does connect with episode 99. It can be seen as part two in a way, the sequel. So if you did want more celestial moon and sun folklore, be sure to go back and check that one out as well. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can treat me to a coffee via my website, which is always very, very much appreciated. Or if you'd like to support the podcast for free, then you can just leave a nice review, give it a quick thumbs up five stars whatever the options are for being nice on whatever platform you are consuming this on if you'd like more ghosts and folklore you can follow me on social media i'm on twitter i'm on facebook and i'm on instagram and as well as this podcast i've written a number of similar weird and wonderful books which are available from all good bookshops offline and on i'm sure you know the places And wherever possible, of course, support your local bookshop. And so, on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember, if you are thinking of burgling the secret lair of a gold hoarding dragon it's best to wait until the sun sets. Until next time, Nosta!